Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURGE, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we'll have a look at a paper uh, published on the Annals of Surgery entitled Classifying Preoperative Opioid Use for Surgical Care. Uh, this will be followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababala Subramanian um, that will uh, continue on uh, from last week. Uh, measures of risks and uh, we will be talking about relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction number needed to treat. Thank you for coming to Cram Search. Um, I'm Josh, I'm a CT and uh, I'm going to be partnering with Gio today and we're going to discuss this paper, um, classifying preoperative opioid use for surgical care. Um, it was published earlier this year in January in the Annals of Surgery and is an American study Gio, um, so what do you think? Got you excited on this one or? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's a fairly hot topic in the States. Um, it's uh, uh, the opioid crisis. We, we've all heard about it. Um, we all know that um, Americans do use quite a lot of opiates. Uh, that's known from popular culture uh, and some statistics. We know that one third of Americans uh, roughly uh, throughout the past year uh, used opiates at some point. Uh, and, you know, we prescribe opiates every day uh, for our patients after lap coli, after a hernia repair. So, yeah, fairly relevant topic. Yeah. So, Gio, so the, what the authors in here have um, um, hypothesized really is if, if you have opiate before operation, you probably will need a top of dose of opiate. You probably need more than usual people. And that's what they're hypothesizing. And they also suggest that um, the surgeons may not be doing a lot in terms of tailoring the, uh, the OPA prescribing um, as per the patient's um, preoperative consumption. So um, in a PICO format, Gio, what would be the PICO of this study? So, well, the patients uh, that uh, we are interested in are patients attending uh, for elective surgery uh, and they select a specific set of procedures uh, for that. Um, it's a little bit tricky to exactly identify um, exposure and comparison. Well, we could say that uh, the eye is really patients that had opiates uh, one year before surgery at some point. Would it be a single prescription or more than one prescription? Um, the comparison group would probably be opiate naive patients in this case. And the outcome, the primary outcome of the study is uh, the need for a further prescription on top of the one that the surgeon gives you when you get discharged. So yeah. back to you, Josh. Yeah, so the reason that Gio said that this is a bit confusing in terms of fitting into PICO is because this is largely a, a observational retrospective study and it is a cross-sessional study. And what it really means is they, they identified um, the um, exposure and also the outcome in one in one single method. So they look at private insurance claim data um, from um, 2008 to 2015. They have a list of incursion patients and major these patients who have 13 most commonly e elective procedures. They look at these patients in terms of their um, consumption of opiate before uh, one up to one year, and they look at the usage, the duration, the dose and how recent it is uh, in terms of how proximal is it to the surgery and also whether it's continued usage or scattered usage. Um, and then they also um, basically measured whether they need a second top of dose of opiate in within 30 days of operations. After that, they have done some really clever um, cluster analysis and then they um, progress into giving us an odd ratios of certain um, particularly trades. So, um, Gio, what is the inclusion criterion here then? 
So, yeah, they included uh, all patients aged 18 uh, to 64 years old uh, that uh, were insured uh, for at least one year pre-op and six months post-op with this particular uh, insurance. Uh, and the patients underwent uh, 13 uh, procedures that they define as uh, common. Uh, they're subdivided into minor and major surgery uh, with minor surgical procedures, including things like varicose veins, lap coles, lap appendixes, and hemorrhoidectomies, uh, but thyroidectomies too. Uh, major surgical procedures in this group uh, were uh, ventral incision, hernia repair, colectomies, um, fundoplications, bariatric surgery, and hysterectomy. So uh, a fair uh, mixed pot of, of different procedures, some of them, um, despite being minor, being quite painful, such as hemorrhoidectomies. Um, they uh, took off the pictures, uh, everyone age 65 or above. Um, and this is a choice that they made because they are considering a um, private insurance database and uh, they feel that above 65, the prevalence of people in the states insured with Medicare and Medicaid is significantly higher uh, compared to less than 65 years old. Therefore, that would have uh, made the data a little bit uh, more dirty. Um, they also took off the picture um, every patient when things went wrong. And when I say things went wrong, I mean uh, people that stayed in hospital for uh, more than 30 days, uh, people that required a, a further surgical procedure within the six months uh, after their original procedure, and people that did not go home but went to some other form of uh, care facility. So um, let's have a look at uh, the included population. Uh, as you can see, they the number of included patients is quite high, it's almost a quarter million, um, 267,000. Um, just to briefly go through uh, the main points uh, related to this population, um, the vast majority of patients here uh, had a minor procedure, 77%, um, uh, and a relative minority, 22%, uh, had a major procedure. Uh, luckily, the vast majority of these patients were opiate naive. Uh, only a minority were actually non-naive. Uh, apologies for the chart. So uh, yeah, that's encouraging to know um, as a baseline. Um, Josh, back to you. Yeah, um, so they basically then got um, the total number of patients and they have used um, some very clever um, um, uh, machine learning and cluster analysis into grouping this patient into six group, excluding the group of patients who is opaque naive. Um, as you can see, they have considered the total dose, uh, the duration, the continuities, and the, uh, and how recent it is in terms of to the operations. Um, it's quite interesting that they use cluster analysis. Gio, can you tell me uh, or tell us more about this, about cluster uh, analysis? Yeah, of course, cluster analysis is a, uh, non-aided machine learning algorithm uh, that is designed to identify uh, patterns um, in a specific population and cluster data points in groups. So basically, you give the data to the machine and the machine on its own looks through the data and try and find out association and groups um, and groups um, data points together, uh, giving you an outcome. Uh, in this specific case, the authors uh, ran uh, the database uh, through this machine learning algorithm and then uh, based on some specific variables, um, subgrouped um, a little bit more. So they uh, originally, I believe, had 12 groups, and they uh, then pinned it down to uh, seven, including the uh, naive uh, patients. So, Josh, back to you. Yeah, so after they have done this subgrouping and they look at um, um, basically likelihood, and you can see that on this chart it has shown that and um, basically, the more or the longer um, opiate that you have used before operation, the more the likelihood that you're going to need a, um, a a top up dosage, uh, regardless of um, how much you were discharged with. I think, um, and then they they also measure a lot of secondary outcomes. Geo is going to tell us more about. Yeah, so they, they uh, actually have quite a quite a list of uh, secondary outcomes. Um, now, uh, if you do have a minor procedure, um, you are less likely to uh, require a top-up prescription compared to a major procedure, um, which is, you would say, probably expected, but 
not so much if you consider that in manual procedure there's also hemorrhoidectomies. Um, prescription size uh, correlates with your uh, likelihood of needing more tablets. So if I give you a lot of tablets, you are less likely to need more tablets. That's fairly straightforward. Um, if you're a smoker, you are more likely to need a second prescription, as well as if you have mental health problems, uh, if you have a background of arthritis or back pain, and interestingly, if you use benzodiazepines before a surgery. Um, now, these are all, uh, you know, relatively expected um, outcomes. Uh, what is uh, quite interesting is the chart on the right side of this slide. Um, so, um, this chart um, represents for each of the groups that we uh, discussed earlier on, uh, the median number of tablets that are uh, provided uh, to the patient. Uh, and as you can see, uh, these increase as we go through the groups. Um, this is very striking when we go from the medium chronic group to the high chronic group. However, uh, the data is distributed in a way such as um, pretty much for every step, there is statistically significant difference. So uh, it looks like the surgeon actually looked at how much opiates the patients were requiring originally uh, and uh, provided an adequate prescription, perhaps. So, uh, Josh, back to you. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk about limitation of this paper. I think um, being a, a cross-sectional study, I think the major thing really is confindings. I think it's hardly surprising that with or without operation, um, chronic opiate users may require more opiate after discharge because your surgery may not necessarily cure you from pain. Um, secondly, um, minor and major surgery classification is really interesting. If you're really interested, you can go back to Cram Surge website, episode four, where we talk about um, um, analgesics and, and uh, pain. And in there, actually, they suggested that um, hemorrhoidectomy could be more painful than a nephrectomy in some studies. So this really reflects that um, perhaps minor and major operation does not really reflect your pain level. Um, then finally, in, in terms of confindings, um, because there is a lack of specific or procedure-based protocol, um, patients were basically discharged on different amount of analgesics um, and, and also different um, type of analgesics, really. And there is no centralized protocol, and this study does not, did not actually consider those um, uh, additional um, analgesics apart from benzodiazepine. In terms of generalized abilities, I think Geo have briefly discussed about this. Um, they have looked at, at privacy insurance data, which essentially means that I'm, I'm obviously I'm not expert in American um, healthcare, but by, by the looks of things, um, private insurance data is, is not really um, a, a, is not um, available for everyone. Most people are um, either either you have to use Medicare or Medicaid, um, which is um, uh, basically, I think this introduced a bias in terms of selection bias and, and, and by the social economic status. And um, another point that I would like to add is a lack of clinical implications. Um, in the discussion um, bit of the uh, paper, the author suggested that um, there are many problems with um, chronic opiate usage. Um, they suggested that the surgeons uh, may not have screened um, uh, patients' preoperative opiate usage. Um, in their pre-op assessment, they may not have taken the chance to counsel their patients about opiate usage, um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. However, we found that actually this data and what it's shown does not really reflect that, and actually it may not have a, a, a strong clinical suspicion. I mean, what it only um, um, suggested really is that um, there are 40% of people who probably is on some sort of opiate before operation, but it doesn't suggest how it uh, is related to clinical care extractures. Um, so this link really to the final point about funding and conflicts. Um, several authors in this study actually received funding from the um, their substance abuse and mental health authorities, um, which means that they are very prone to getting confirmation bias. Um, so that's the, all the imitation that we can thought of. And um, Gio, can you summarize for us, please? Yeah, so um, to conclude, uh, we can say that according to this study, uh, if a patient is using some opiates uh, before surgery uh, with whatever pattern described, uh, there's a higher chance uh, of uh, that patient requiring uh, a second dose of opiate prescription within 30 days uh, after their operation, on top of the one that was originally provided by the surgeon. Um, so um, 
we uh, have put together this little summary um, at the end. Um, as you can see, um, the thing that using cluster analysis uh, in this context is actually reasonably clever. And I think the authors play a lot uh, on the quality of their classification and the title of the paper. Um, there are a lot of confounding factors, and I think Josh has gone through uh, them uh, very well. Um, from a clinical uh, point of view, um, this definitely confirms the fact that opiates in the general population, uh, particularly for surgical procedures, uh, are very commonly used, uh, and that the opiate issues that we've seen in the States uh, is actually uh, very true. Um, and we think that the classification that they are providing here might be used in the future to uh, identify patients at higher risk of requiring uh, more prescriptions. Um, however, the generalizability, as Josh pointed out, is uh, relatively poor. Uh, and at the moment, despite this classification being very clever, actually clinical applications are very, very limited. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, so we talked about uh, some measures of risk in the last tutorial and we focused on uh, odd ratios and relative risk. So we will revisit those concepts very briefly and then move on to some other measures of risk uh, for, the rest of the, for the rest of the tutorial. Right, so, uh, so what's, uh, what's uh, odd ratio? So as we heard from Josh and uh, Gio, odd ratio is simply the ratio of two odds and the two odds are the odds of the event happening in one group to that in the other group. Okay, so uh, it is a measure of risk, and we've uh, heard before that it is uh, it can be an exaggerated estimate of your true risk, um, but it is something that you can calculate only in a case control study, where you don't know the incidences um, of the event happening in the exposed and the non-exposed group as opposed to the relative risk, which is the ratio of two probabilities. So for odds ratio, we say it's a ratio of two odds, and for relative risk, we say it's a ratio of two probabilities. And the two probabilities are the probability of the event happening in one group to that of the other group. Okay, so I hope um, this concept is a bit more familiar now, and if it isn't, then um, by all means, uh, check out the, um, the first part of the measures of risk tutorial and that's on the internet. So we're going to talk about uh, some other measures, and these include the relative risk reduction, oops, the absolute risk reduction, the number needed to treat, and the attributable risk. And uh, the first three measures are quite related to each other, so I'll try and explain all of these with an example, and then uh, I have a couple of slides on attributable risk. So this can be a little bit complicated, especially if this is the first time that you're hearing about these measures. But uh, by all means, you know, look back at this uh, tutorial at the PowerPoint later in your own time. And I'm sure if you've uh, looked at it two or three times, it will all become uh, really clear. So I've only got eight to nine slides more, and we'll take it one step at a time and slowly, and uh, hopefully that will be easy to then uh, digest the information that I'm presenting. Okay, so here's an example. So we've got a 70-year-old female who presented with a breast lump that turned out to be cancer on biopsy and then had surgery. So you've got some information about the histology. It is a 45 millimeter sized tumor, ER negative, uh, HER2 positive, and she had positive lymph nodes. So this is all the information that I have. Bear in mind that I'm not a breast surgeon, so uh, don't ask me any more questions about um, uh, uh, the details of the case. But based on this example, if you wanted to know, or the patient wishes to know, what a survival is likely to be, you've got a lot of um, very useful online calculators that make use of um, this kind of information and give you an estimate of survival and they can provide estimates on a number of outcomes, uh, but let's just focus on survival. Now, these online calculators make use of the tons and tons of data that has been produced over the last few decades, 
and uh, and they um, use the data to be able to uh, give you information on uh, um, potential um, outcomes in terms of survival and recurrence and so on and so forth. So one such online calculator is um, the PREDICT tool. The website for the tool is uh, there on the screen for you. This is um, part of the NHS website, so uh, um, you can put in um, information on any patient on this website, on this calculator, and it'll give you some um, data on outcomes. So this is the data I got for this patient. So you see um, the uh, table on the top right. So the overall survival uh, is presented um, for the surgery only um, group, or if this patient had just had surgery, then they predict the overall survival will be 22%. If this patient had chemotherapy as well, uh, we're not going to the specifics of what chemotherapy, but if this patient had chemotherapy as well, then the survival will go up to 30%. This is overall five-year survival. The website also gives you data for 10-year survival. So for this patient with um, just surgery, the overall 10-year survival would be 11%. If the patient also had chemotherapy, the survival would go up to 17%. So this is a 10-year survival. Now, let's just focus on the five-year survival data and let's look at it again. So with surgery, the likelihood of this patient living for five years is 22%. And if you add chemotherapy, it goes up to 30%. So keep these numbers in mind because now I'm going to ask you um, some questions. Right. What I want you to do is to look at the statements that will appear on your screen. And uh, either you can take a pen and paper and try and work things out, or you make a mental note of these statements and uh, figure out for me which of these statements are true. So uh, the, the first statement is chemotherapy will increase your chances of survival over five years by 8%. So the question is, is this true or is this false based on what I had said to you just a minute ago. We, we can go back and look at that slide again. So with surgery, the overall survival is 22%. With chemotherapy, it goes up to 30%. Okay, so that's the first statement. The second statement is this. The chances of living up to five years will go up by 36% if you have chemotherapy. Is that true or false? The next statement, is if you have chemotherapy, you're 10% less likely to die in the next five years. Is this true or false? And the last statement is chemotherapy would be needed to be given to 12 such patients for one patient to see a benefit in five year survival. So um, if you're watching this as a video uh, later on, you can pause the video and think about it and then come back and resume. So I'm going to give you um, maybe half a minute and then we can have a discussion. If you did want me to go back to the previous slide, let me know. We can have a quick chat now if, if anyone wants to unmute and uh, and uh, talk to me and tell me what you think. So my, I got true, false, false, true. True, false, false, true. Okay. Any other um, uh, answers? No, no one else wants to have that, I guess. Gio? Um, no, I'm still behind with the calculations. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you, I'll, I'll back up, Josh, what I've already said. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anybody else beg to differ? No? Okay. Fine. So, here are the answers, and I think you'll be a little bit surprised. The first is true, second is true, third is true, fourth is true. Oh. All four are true. Okay, so we'll explain why, and hopefully then you will understand what the various um, uh, other measures of risk um, that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation actually mean. 
So the first one is pretty straightforward, I think. So that's what is called absolute risk reduction. So uh, absolute risk reduction is simply the difference in risk in the two groups. EER refer refers to um, experimental group event rate, which is chemotherapy event rate. And CER refers to control event rate, which is the surgery only arm. Yeah. So that's kind of the definition for absolute risk reduction. So we've said before that in one group, the risk is 22%, the other group, um, the risk. When I say risk, I mean the event, and the event here is surviving. So uh, really, it's not a risk in the true sense of the word, but um, for the definitions of these parameters, we call them risk. So the uh, chances of surviving in the two groups are 22 and 30%, and the difference is 8%. So that's the absolute risk reduction. Okay, so that's hopefully straightforward. The second is what we call relative risk reduction or relative risk benefit, if you like, of surviving or living. So essentially, that's the difference in rates between the two groups divided by the control event rate or divided by the rate of surviving in the control group or the non-chemo group. So that is 30 take away 22 divided by 22. So that would be 36. So the relative risk of living up to five years if you had chemotherapy is 36%. Okay. The next um, statement is also true because it is looking at relative risk the other way around. It's not looking at relative risk of living. It's looking at relative risk of dying because we've said less likely to die. So essentially, you're looking at the um, risk of dying, which is 78 take away 70% in the two groups, yeah, divided by the control um, event rate or the risk of dying in the non-chemotherapy group. So that is 78 minus 70 um, divided by 78, which is roughly 10%. Okay. So in the last one is uh, what we call NNT or number needed to treat. The number needed to treat simply refers to the number of patients that need to have a particular intervention or exposure for one additional event to happen. So it simply is the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So if you've got the absolute risk difference uh, or reduction of 8%, you just say one divided by 8%, which is one divided by 0 0.08, which is 12.5. So the reason the number needed to treat um, is important is that it gives some idea to healthcare providers and funders as to how um, useful a particular treatment will be to society. Because it tells them here that you need to give chemotherapy to 12 patients for one person to see a benefit in and their five-year survival rates. Okay, so these are all um, useful parameters of risk. Obviously, they're all quite different. And you can imagine how um, different clinicians might sit down with a patient and talk about risk using these different parameters, particularly absolute risk reductions and relative risk reductions. And when you talk about relative risk reductions, you're, uh, you're talking about the risk of living and going up, or are you talking about the risk of dying going down with the chemo? And, and as you can see, the numbers are all different. So we're not uh, lying here, we're not making anything up, but just looking at uh, the numbers in a different way can give you uh, different estimates of risk. And therefore you see how um, confused patients can get um, if they are being presented risks in many different ways. And you could also see how patients can be easily led astray, if you like, or even manipulated, if you like, if the treating clinician or the surgeon or the nurse specialist has a specific sort of bias or prejudice even towards one treatment or the other. Okay, so it's important for us to understand uh, what is the risk we're talking about and it's impo important for us to think about how we communicate that risk. Okay, now let's just uh, expand on this concept a bit more um, by using a further example, a sort of extreme example. So um, we're going to be talking about absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction using an example. 
So again, looking at the definitions first, absolute risk reduction is simply the absolute difference in risk between treated and non-treated groups. In this scenario, chemotherapy versus only surgery groups. Now the relative risk, risk reduction is the difference in risk between the treated and non-treated groups relative to the non-treated group. So you've got to divide by the risk in the non-treated group. Okay, so let's look at this example, which is essentially um, looking at survival following breast cancer at 10 years. So 10 years survival in a very extreme sort of hypothetical cohort of patients who do rather poorly. So you've got one group of patients who've had surgery with chemotherapy, 100 of them, and two have survived at 10 years, which is quite a low number. And another group of patients who had surgery alone, and again, out of 100 patients, only one survived. So clearly the surgery with chemotherapy group have done better than the surgery alone group, but as you can see, the difference is not massive. So if you look at absolute risk reduction uh, or the benefit of chemotherapy, you can see that the difference in um, survival in the chemo versus the no chemo arm is just 1%, okay? And if you remember um, what we talked about absolute risk, we said that absolute risk in the chemo arm um, is um, the, the survival is 2%. The chance of surviving in the surgery alone arm is 1%. So the difference is 1%, right? If you have a look at relative risk reduction with chemo, like we said before with the definition, you look at the difference between the treated and the non-treated arms or the chemo, uh, surgery with chemo and the surgery alone arms relative to the um, chances of um, survival in the surgery alone arm. Essentially, you're saying you, you subtract these two, so it's two minus one, which is one, and relative to how many would have survived in the surgery alone arm, which is just one. So you've got a relative risk reduction of 100%. So this is an extreme example where the um, chances of survival is quite low, and the chemo um, is making only a small dent in survival, one extra percent surviving, but that's one um, on top of the one person that survived with surgery alone. So relatively, it's making a big impact, 100%, you know, two-fold improvement in survival. But the absolute benefit is just 1%, one person, one person in a total of 100 people if you give chemotherapy. So in an extreme case, you can see how um, you can either tell the patient that it's only 1% will benefit, or you can tell the patient well, actually, there's a two-fold improvement in survival with chemotherapy. Okay, so I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. And then we'll go on to this table, which looks at relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, and the so-called NNT, or the number needed to treat. Now, we go back to the same example that we talked about, uh, wherein the 70-year-old female with particular histological characteristics um, has had surgery, and then you're thinking of whether to give chemotherapy to her or not. So using the same predict um, calculator, we have calculated that at five years, death at five years in the no chemo arm is 78%. If you add chemotherapy, it goes down to 70%. So the absolute risk reduction in death is 8%. That's straightforward. With 78 take away 70 is 8%. Now, Relative risk reduction would be at the absolute risk divided by the death rate at five years. So that would be eight over 78, that would be 10%. Okay, and then NNT or the number needed to treat is simply the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So it's one by 8% or one by 0 0.08, that is 12.5 patients. So essentially you're saying that you need to treat 12 and a half patients, around 12 patients, to reduce the risk of death um, at five years, um, to, to, or to save one life at five years. So that's what the top row means.
Now, if you then want to look at the other 10 years, you do very similar calculations and you find that the number needed to treat to prevent one death at 10 years is um, 17 patients. And the same um, parameter for 15 years is about 25 patients. Obviously, as time goes, more and more people are uh, going to succumb to either the disease or to other um, uh, pathologies and the number needed to treat is going to go up and up. And you could do similar uh, calculations for other outcomes as well, such as recurrence. Okay. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind is that this number needed to treat for a specific intervention really depends on the outcome you're measuring. So the number needed to treat for this chemotherapy would be dependent on what particular outcome you're talking about. If it is death, is it death from any cause or is it death from breast cancer? And if it's death, is it death at five years, two years, 10 years, 15 years? Or is it something uh, that is not to do with death? For example, recurrence of disease or maybe even quality of life. So you've got to keep in mind that the NNT or the number needed to treat for any intervention is entirely dependent on the outcomes. The outcomes need to be defined very clearly. And then you can compare uh, the effects of that particular intervention with the NNT from another intervention if you wanted to do so. The other thing to keep in mind is that the relative risk reduction is always higher than the absolute risk reduction. So as you can see from the table, as the absolute risk reduction goes down, the relative risk reduction also goes down, but it's always higher than the absolute risk. Okay, just like we um, talked in the last tutorial that um, odds ratios are an exaggeration of the relative risk. I'm, um, I'm saying here that the relative risk reduction is an exaggerated estimate of the absolute risk reduction. Right, so we're moving on to a slightly different concept called attributable risk. Attributable risk is also known as risk difference. And essentially, it's a difference in rates of an outcome. And in the example we're discussing, the outcome was death. In the groups with and without the risk factor of the intervention, and the intervention we've been discussing was chemotherapy. So essentially, attributable risk is a difference in the rates of death in the two groups. Yeah. So it can be used to quantify impact of specific risk factors or interventions. In our example, it's a chemotherapy on an, any multifactorial disease or outcomes. Now, what does this mean? What does multifactorial disease or multifactorial outcomes mean? Now, a couple of hundred years ago, when people talk about diseases and causations, and they were focusing entirely on infectious diseases. For example, cholera, or the plague, or tuberculosis. And the prevailing concept at the time was that of single agent, single disease phenomenon. In other words, most infectious diseases were caused by a single specific agent. So if you had Vibrio cholerae, you get cholera. If you had Mycobacterium tuberculosis, you get TB. And the relationship is quite linear and simple. However, the majority of us that deal with diseases today deal with multifactorial diseases, such as lung cancer or breast cancer, where there's not just one uh, factor that causes disease, but a variety of genetic and, and environmental factors cause disease. And there's a significant interplay between the various genetic and environmental factors. So it's a lot more complicated. Same holds true for outcomes, such as wound infection, survival after cancer treatment, and recurrence after hernia repair. So it's not one specific risk factor, but a variety of risk factors. And if you want to know what the impact of each individual risk factor is, or what would be the improvement if you eliminate that risk factor, then you want to know what the attributable risk is, or the risk that you can attribute to that one factor. Right, so how does attributable risk differ from relative risk? Let's say, um, talk about another example. So if you're looking at the relationship between, say, a risk factor and a specific cancer, let's say cancer X, you've got this typical two by two contingency table where you've got cancers in healthy um, cohorts arranged as columns, and you've got the, um, the risk factor presence or absence arranged as rows. 
And if you remember um, the how you calculate relative risk, we said that relative risk is simply the ratio of two probabilities, which is the probability of cancer in people with the risk factor, that is A by A plus B, divided by the probability of cancer in people without the risk factor, which is C by C plus D. Now, attributable risk or risk difference, however, is simply the difference between these two properties, not the ratio, which is relative risk, but the difference. So attributable risk is the probability of having cancer uh, if you have the risk factor, minus the probability of having cancer if you do not have the risk factor. And that's all it is. It's a, it's a difference between probabilities, while relative risk is a ratio of probability. Right. And here's a picture, um, it's a schematic diagram of um, all potential risk factors that could cause cancer X, for example. So you've got in here a partial Venn diagram that shows smoking, obesity, diet, and genetic factors that play a role in causing cancer X. You can also see that there are a number of, uh, there's a big space here, which is unfilled, which means that for many of these cancers, you know, we do, haven't identified all the risk factors, or we're putting it down to random occurrence or chance, and therefore um, the risk factors only account for a proportion of um, patients with cancer X. Okay, so if you then want to figure out, you know, how much each of these risk factors predispose to cancer X, you work out what we call the attributable risk. So you could say that the attributable risk for cancer X from smoking is about 10%. Genetic factors maybe play a role in another 10%, and so on and so forth. And this kind of information is useful for people who say, who uh, then say, okay, what can we do to reduce the risk of cancer X? Which are the modifiable factors? And which modifiable factors would you then try and target? And in this particular example, it would pay you a lot more to target smoking as opposed to, for example, targeting diet. And this obviously would be different for different cancers. Okay, so I hope that explains attributable risk a bit more. So we talked about relative risk, absolute risk, attributable risk, and the number needed to treat. You've got to keep in mind that all of these require the incident, incident rates. In other words, the denominator should be all the individuals exposed to the risk factor or intervention. In other words, as we've discussed before, you need a cohort type study to be able to calculate these measures of risk. So these cannot therefore be calculated using data from a case control study. And that's absolutely critical to remember, um, especially when you're setting out to do a study or when you're critiquing um, a paper. As opposed to odds ratios, which can only be calculated from a case control study uh, and then should not be calculated from a cohort study. Okay, right, so we've come to the end of this tutorial. So we've talked about uh, the numerous ways there are in, of expressing risk. We've talked about relative risk reductions, absolute risk reduction and attributable risk. We've talked about the number needed to treat. And remember that the number needed to treat is simply the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So we talked about uh, relative values being important, especially when comparing different interventions. So uh, uh, they're certainly better than the odds ratio, and they give you a, a true estimate of risk that you can communicate with each. However, you've got to remember that these are only relative values. And you've got to remember that it's usually best to rely on absolute values when making decisions and in the care of an individual patient. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.